Hi everyone. Um, yes, and uh, Tim flies home this afternoon, so I, I look forward to sleeping at some point in the near future. Uh, so what I wanted to do today was to really talk a little bit about disrupting the status quo and the fact that uh, and and some of the the some of the things that are actually impacting upon governments today that are creating um, uh, uh, um, creating a reason that we need to change, basically. There's a lot of background noise there. So um, uh, we are basically in a period of great change and great expectations uh, in a lot of ways, um, in ways that we kind of haven't really been before. Uh, I should very briefly say, because uh, the intro didn't say it, my background is actually 10 years in the IT industry, then I worked for a minister for three years, but don't hold that against me. Um, I, uh, mostly because I wanted to understand how the executive and legislative arms of federal government worked. And it was interesting and it was insightful. And having done that, I then wanted to go into the administrative arm of government. So I've been working uh, for, I spent a year doing um, half of that in federal government and half of that in the ACT uh, government. Uh, and I'm currently working for the first ever uh, whole of Australian government chief technology office, officer, um, John Sheridan in finance and I've, as of two days ago I am now the uh, uh, Director of uh, Coordination and Gov 2.0, which is very exciting. So uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so, so there's a lot of things that are going to be changing around here, as they say, um, but, uh, there's, and there's a lot of exciting things to happen, but I'll, I'll come to that. To just go a little bit back in time, why are we facing such changes now and why does government need to adapt um, now more so than ever before. So I'll, I'll go through some of the imperatives that I've noticed and, um, and I've had some interesting, and a lot of what I'm saying I've got uh, available in various different uh, blog posts and I'll actually be blogging um, most of this speech so feel free to not you know, take copious notes if you were even interested in doing that but um, uh, there'll be sort of notes and references available afterwards. I guess the first one that's really interesting particularly for Australia although I think this is uh, happening also around the world is that we've hit a bit of a tipping point a tipping point in digital engagement with government. For a lot of years, uh, how many people here actually work in government? Okay, how many people are work in uh, the broader ICT industry? Um, okay, so um, one of the things, so my focus is largely going to be around, around government. Uh, w one of the things that was really a pushback for doing any sort of digital services was, well, what about the digital divide? The moment you do a digital service, you're you know, creating a, a problem for some people that are not um, online, and that is a completely valid and fair point. Uh, the tipping point we've hit, though, is that um, more citizens are now engaging with government digitally than through any other medium. Now, what does that mean, practically, and from a policy perspective, and from a resourcing perspective? Well, what it means is that if we put the resourcing and the um, uh, into actually doing really great online services, and we enable more people to actually effectively self-service, that actually frees up resources to help our more disempowered people, our people with more complex cases, it, uh, our more vulnerable uh, citizens. So actually, uh, digital engagement and digital services is a way to help with um, broach the digital divide, because human resources are expensive, but creating um, automated, self-enabling uh, online services is actually a great way to, uh, to, to help more people help themselves. So in 2009 in Australia was when we actually hit that, uh, that tipping point where more citizens are, are engaging with, with government online than by any other means. And, um, and around the world that started kicking off in different places as well. Uh, a second imperative, the internet is changing society expectations. This is one of my personal favourite topics and I won't, I won't go on too much about it, but it's worth noting that because of uh, the internet and people who integrate the internet into how they do everyday things, so not just people that you know go and do a search once a week. I, I love these um, all these surveys that say you know how often do you use Twitter? Is it once a week or once a day or once a um, month? And I'm like, I'm not off it. <laughs> Is there an option that says I'm 100% connected pretty much 24/7? Um, and, and there really isn't because the the way that we think about how we inter inter um, um, integrate technology into our lives is quite changing. How many people here have heard the term of uh, wearable computing? Mm, cool, that's more than the usual sort of uh, thing. But for everyone else, wearable, we're getting, we're getting to this, uh, who, who's heard the term body hacking? Slightly less. I mean, we're getting to this phase where technology isn't just the, the thing you pick up, and I hope you all like my nice um, Ubuntu Air. Um, it's, uh, it might look like a Mac Air, but it doesn't actually run any Mac software. Um, but um, the, um, we're getting to this point where it's not just the device you pick up, it's the one that you wear continually, it's the glasses that you have. Um, uh, body hacking is a whole new area where people are starting to actually embed technology into their bodies. I have a friend in Melbourne 
who has a um, RFID chip, a radio frequency identity chip in his arm. And you know, so he doesn't have any keys. He uses it to unlock his house, he uses it to, un uh, to start his car, he uses it for his um, cryptography stuff on his computer, all his security stuff. You know, why wouldn't you? It, it makes your life simpler. Uh, so uh, we're getting to this point when we're right on the cusp of getting into a whole new era of how we engage with technology and how we integrate technology and how we do things. And 3D printing, by the way, is going to change everything again because then we completely um, remove the barriers to everyone having access to different property, which will be quite interesting. But people expect more than ever before. They expect to be heard. Uh, they expect to be part of the conversation. They expect to be able to connect with, whoev with whoever they want. Um, the old sort of geeky adage, and, and my background is definitely geeky, um, is you know, of, of to route around damage has been translated into a, a social phenomenon. People expect to be able to get around things that are put in their way, whether it's technical, whether it's social, whether it's whatever. So, um, so people expect more. They're, they're actually more, but not, not just expecting more, they're actually more empowered than ever before. We're living in a peer-to-peer -peer society now. So if you don't deliver a great service, they will go elsewhere. Now, there is a big question, I think, uh, around what is the role of government, and that's a whole other talk, um, but, um, the, there are sort of a lot of questions around, well, does government um, um, always meet the needs of citizens? Is it the role of government to provide the one and only particular service? Or is it the role of government to provide a reference implementation of a service and provide it, uh, the APIs to the data and to the um, services themselves so that, you know, so that the market can actually compete on delivering that service as well? Maybe, in some cases. Government holds a lot of data. Um, government also has a lot of responsibilities when it comes to privacy, when it comes to service delivery, when it comes to actually serving the needs of our citizens. And, um, but there is a question, I think, around, um, around to what level. But I won't go into that right now. Um, ubiquitous mobile connectivity is obviously another pressure and another imperative for change. The way that people expect to uh, connect with and um, communicate with and be served by um, public services uh, is, is fundamentally quite different. And not only that, but also within departments and agencies. I mean, the actual workforce expects to be connected. The amount of people that just bring a second phone to work because you know, their work phone is abysmal and they can't do all the things they want to do on it, so they just bring a second phone in and that's the one that they actually get their real work done on. Um, there's a question around productivity there. If a person is more productive on a particular platform, why wouldn't you let them use that platform and get the productivity gains rather than forcing them to use a, another platform which is not their platform of choice? Um, I you know, don't advocate that everyone uses um, uh, Linux because I know that some people, you know, if you gave it to them straight away and just said, okay, this is all you can use, their productivity would go down. Uh, me, however, when I'm forced to use something that's not Linux, my productivity goes down. So it's, it's a matter of understanding your workforce and actually trying to figure out what are you trying to achieve. I think that the, the catch call of efficiency and productivity has become a bit of an end to itself, but why are we trying to be more productive? Why are we trying to be more effective and efficient? Why are we trying to save money? There's, you know, the, there's obviously a lot of budget constraints, and I'll come to that, but um, the, there's the question of what are we actually trying to achieve, and I don't think that's always as clearly stipulated as it could be. So companies expect to connect with us, um, and uh, obviously there's going to be new opportunities with uh, high-speed internet that changes things even more. I think that one of the major imperatives we have is that uh, the success of a policy or a program or a project is not necessarily as obvious as it used to be. You know, uh, and in fact, quite often, um, clear outcomes are not even you know, uh, articulated from the start. So, because uh, you know, people don't want to fail any more than they don't want to succeed in a lot of cases, which is kind of fascinating. Um, but the idea of saying, well, actually, how you publicly communicate your policy and how you publicly communicate the success of that policy is almost as important as succeeding in the policy at all. Uh, there, there are several very high profile policies that um, I actually studied over the last few years that, that demonstrate that you can have actually a reasonably good policy, you can have a pretty good implementation, but if you don't communicate that well publicly and someone else runs off with your narrative, then your policy effectively becomes a failure. And we can all think of a, of a few um, that um, have terrible public perception that actually when you look at the statistics and the numbers are not terrible policies. Uh, so your policy success is now directly linked to public perception of it, which is a quite of a terrifying thing given that so many people in the public service don't tend to intuitively, as a matter of course, um, engage publicly um, in, in those kind of communications. Tight fiscal conditions. Obviously this is the biggest, the biggest problem that has been faced recently. Um, but I don't think the implications of that have been entirely realised. 
what's happened is over, over many years, there's been not only no new investment, but IT departments have been asked to do more with less, um, have been, um, uh, and, and have got more and more into bunker mentality, and quite understand understandably so. Um, there's been a lack of prioritization based on a, on a holistic vision, and, a, and prioritization has basically been, well, you know, in a lot of organizations, it's who can write the prettiest paper. In some organizations, it's, you know, who can scream the loudest. In some organizations, it really just comes down to, well, which is the biggest security threat. Um, but you haven't got that prioritization of spending based on where are we trying to go. You know, it's, it's based on how can we cope with where we're at. Um, and that has led us to a situation where a lot of the solutions we have in place and a lot of the ways that we're doing service delivery um, have been stretched as far as they can be stretched and we desperately need to shift um, if we're going to remain relevant and have those services continue to, um, to deliver what they're supposed to deliver. Which leads to the disconnect between strategy and IT. So because of the bunker mentality of IT, and I mean I've worked in IT departments, I completely understand where they're coming from. Um, I've been in it myself. Someone comes to you and says, hey, we want to do this no new shiny thing, it's going to be fantastic. And you're like, you're an idiot. Um, what you're asking for makes no sense, it, it can't be supported, it's going to create these security risks, and then they say, just make it so. So it's, it, there's a disconnect, serious disconnect, and this isn't just in government, it's I think across the board, between business and IT. So the business of an organization will sort of go and they'll do their, their strategic vision about where they want to go and it'll you know, have lots of words like synergy in it. And, um, and then they'll come back to the IT department and they'll say, so we want to do blah. And by the way, we want to use this product. And by the way, we want to you know, uh, use that particular, and by, and by the way, we want to go cloud. Um, uh, how many of you remember SOA when that was hype? Yeah, cool, a few of you. There's a wonderful website called soafacts.com. I suggest the rest of you check it out. It's a, it's a parody of chucknorrisfacts.com. Um, and it is a website all about just how ridiculous the hype got around SOA. And we're seeing exactly the same thing with cloud and Cloud, is, there are definitely opportunities in cloud, absolutely. Are there new technologies? Yeah, there are a few, but realistically, it is also something to be very wary of. Because if you just say, we'll just go cloud first, which a lot of um, people are trying to advocate, well, there's a huge difference between me hosting an open data platform in the cloud, which I myself am in the process of um, implementing right now, and hosting you know, a, a health service in the cloud. Um, what are the jurisdictional um, uh, requirements? What are the implications around whether I can even enforce the, the service level agreement um, requirements that I have in order to keep this service running up and running? There, there are so many complications in, in place, and so it's, it's something that needs to be considered very carefully. But this disconnect between strategy and IT means that um, a lot of people in an organization will just say, well, we just want to do blah, and IT is saying no, but it's okay, we found this $5,000 $5, cheap service online that we can just set up. So you've got the you know, HR and PR and, and um, uh, comms and you know, all the other business units of your organization just running off and doing stuff. All over the place, there are new websites springing up. And how sustainable are they? Oh, <laughs> it's a scary, scary situation that we're actually heading towards because rather than actually simplifying things and making it more citizen-centric, we're seeing as a result of the lockdown of IT and the disconnect between business and IT, we're actually seeing things become a lot more complicated for people. And I think that a lot of people in government, um, particularly in federal government, but across the board, do not think of themselves as a whole of government. The fact is that citizens do not care how we're structured. They just don't. They don't care which department or which sphere of government is actually delivering a particular service. They just want the service. They want to be able to put in their postcode because they don't trust you yet. They're not going to create an account with you yet. They want to put in their postcode and say, what are all the health services close to me? Um, I don't care if it's federal, state, or local. Now, getting towards that is a, is a is a tricky thing, that I'll, I'll, and I'm going to outline to you some of my thoughts about that. But, um, but we're still in this mentality of thinking of our business unit and, as a cog. And it's okay because my cog is perfect. It's shiny and all the, all the teeth in my cog, are, they work really well and I've, I've spent a lot of time polishing it and it looks really, really good and when I turn it, it, it turns freely. And you say, yeah, but the machine is broken. <laughs> But it's okay, my cog is really nice. Uh, so everyone's focused on their cog, and even though their cog is completely disconnected from every other cog, and the cog next to them might be completely broken down. It's not my problem because I'm just looking at my cog. The fact is, in government, we are exactly as strong as our weakest link. So we need to make sure, hello, we need to make sure our weakest links are, are stronger, and we need to start thinking of ourselves as one entity when it comes, not one entity, but certainly one entity when it comes to service delivery. How do we do service delivery in a consistent and cohesive and citizen-centric way that actually uh, removes the idea that citizens have to understand exactly how we work in order to get access to service or information? Um, we should be making it simpler. So IT people are seen as no people. 
um, they end up because of that those limitations being slow to adapt and change, and there's uh, there's a lot of res uh, there's a lot of pushback, you know, and often fairly so, but it becomes a habit of pushback um, based on you know some stupid things coming through, and then you start to just make assumptions. Um, but the most important thing here is that the strategic development for that organization is completely missing a vital ingredient. It's missing what I like to call the geek factor. All right. Geeks are your best, your absolute best resource. Right? They are your, your winning card. They are the people who have their finger on the pulse of what society is doing and where society is going. Hello. <laughs> they are the ones who understand how what you're talking about might actually look in implementation. Um, and they are the ones who will be able to give you just through some good, and uh, not all geeks, obviously, you're going to have some people who just want to figure out how to optimize that particular database to, you know, that tiny um, percentage of a second to go faster. And that's cool. But there will be, in all of your organizations, um, uh, technology thought leaders who just love technology. And if you get them involved in your strategic development from the start, then your strategy is going to be more implementable, your strategy is going to be more realistic. And when it comes to actually, you know, engaging with IT to get it moving, you're actually going to be, they're going to feel part of it and they're going to have a certain amount of ownership of it and they're going to want to see it succeed. Um, what I've seen happen over many years is that IT, and this has happened over many years, technology generally has been seen as the thing that the geeks do and the rest of society has outsourced all responsibility. The amount of people now that are getting into, uh, how many of you heard of the whole sort of design thinking space? Yeah, a few. Okay, so this is a, this is a space which is all about, okay, how do, we, how do we design a service so that it, it, it's, it's sort of this citizen-centric approach, but it's about finding new and innovative ways to design ways to do things. And it's, it's, it's actually a very clever concept in some ways, but um, in some ways it's also stuff that anyone who's any good at their job in designing a service should have been doing the entire time. So it's, it's, a, it's again, a little bit hyped. Um, but what I see is a lot of people coming into that space saying, oh, well, what we're going to do is we're going to apply some design methodology and then we'll get a great outcome but we'll leave the technology to other people because it's not about the technology. It's like, it's all about the technology. If you don't have technologists involved, nothing you can do, nothing you can think of um, will be able to be implemented effectively. So there's my little rant. Um, some other imperatives. The impact of 24 by 7 politics and media obviously has been a bit of a problem um, and makes it harder for the public service to actually move and harder for the public service to respond uh, effectively. My personal take on that is that actually transparency is the best defense for good evidence-based policy. When we develop a policy response in isolation, and you know, and a lot of the time it's very good because there's a lot of good subject matter experts in government, there's um, a lot of you know, people that, that, um, that we go to to get their expertise as well, and you know, we create something that, that you know, could be the best possible policy you can imagine. And then it goes to the minister, and then it, it may or may not look like that after that part of the process. Um, and then whatever happens after that, there's a question around, well, um, if, it, if they go in another direction and that fails, who's accountable? Well, they get to stand up and say, well, uh, that was the advice we were given and you know, then it all just falls back on the public service. The um, public service and politics has been so closely entwined in the, in the um, hearts and minds of so many of our citizens that it's very, very difficult for the public service to uh, rise above that kind of stuff in a lot of ways. So I think it's actually kind of imperative and vital that we have a very strong um, engagement directly with citizens, uh, that when we're developing policy, we do it in a transparent and open way because it gives us the best chance of having an evidence-based policy with some peer review. Um, I worked uh, for a little bit of time in um, uh, computer forensics kind of stuff and, um, and I've applied a lot of those skills. So if you have you know, 4,000 people contribute to a consultation and you can say, well, the, the public feedback to this idea was 99% negative, but then I apply some forensics um, and analysis skills and I can say, yeah, but 80% of those people work for that company or work for that lobby group or come from that region or were based in that country over there or, 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 or. gives you all the context that we've never really had before to be able to get um, a better analysis of what's going into these consultations. So um, we actually have some very, very good opportunities to use the internet and to use um, uh, transparency and online tools to uh, accentuate how we've done policy um, development, not just consultation, but co uh, policy development, and then to have a um, very public and evidence-based position that um, helps encourage people to follow an evidence-based approach. Um, so there's, there's obviously a lot of ex uh, expense in the replication of effort across, across agencies. I'll just skip through a couple of last um, imperatives. Um, skills is a big problem in a lot of ways. Um, the skills for online engagement 
are um, quite substantially lacking in the government, uh, in the public service, should I say, and uh, quite often it's, it's given to the people in comms. Now, the people that are in comms uh, are used to engaging in, um, uh, in their job are very much around the premise um, that the media exist as one of the very few one-to-many mechanisms to actually um, communicate to the general public. So, okay, so we'll figure out how to optimise how we deal with the media and then, you know, then the media become our one-to-many. The internet is now our one-to-many. We don't actually have to go through the media. We still need to work with the media, of course, but there is a very different skill set in talking to a real person than talking to and in the language of journalism, right? Uh, there is a very different set of motivations. People generally, the, the general citizen actually just wants to know what's going on. The journalist is looking for the angle. They're looking for, you know, very, very different motivations. And the other thing is that a lot of the time, a lot of public servants are, um, uh, are sort of told, well, you know, you need to get approval for anything that you say online, for anything you say on social media. And yet, when you call up the help desk of one of the agencies, you know, you're talking to a real person, and they're, they're not saying to you, now, listen, just hold on one second, I'm just going to go get approval for this thing I'm about to say. Okay, just hold on one second, I'm just going to go get approval for this thing I'm about to say. It's ridiculous. Why are we not applying exactly the same policies that we have in, s in customer service to online engagement? That's exactly what's happening throughout industry. It's exactly what's happening in telcos. It's exactly what's happening in so many other places. And yet in government, we keep getting stuck in this, oh, well, we need to have a social media policy before we can possibly engage online. Well, you already have a social media policy. It's called your customer support policy. Um, and, um, and there's bunches of agencies that have really excelled in this space and done some really, really great stuff. So I think there's, there's now hundreds and hundreds of um, uh, social media presences and Twitter accounts and blogs and all these kinds of things happening, which is a really, really good sign. But, um, but there, there is still much more skill um, required and really getting beyond it, just seeing it as comms exercise and getting into that sort of customer service exercise. Um, and there are, I guess, um, dangers and opportunities for engaging um, uh, broader skills and experience uh, and expertise throughout the public service. I mean, being able to say, look, we want to put together an online engagement team from anywhere in the department or agency or in the company, you know, anyone that's interested, give us a yell. Um, I once had a very large department um, uh, uh, consult with me about their, um, well, talk to me about their social media policy, and they were getting my feedback, and they said, so, how can we get all of our SES online? I said, you shouldn't. And they said, what? I said, well, you shouldn't. You've got a bunch of SES that don't want to be online. And if you've got people that don't actually want to be on Twitter, and you're forcing them to be on Twitter as a matter of policy, it's going to suck for them, and it's going to suck for you. Because uh, they, they, you know, people can smell it if you don't genuinely want to be there. I had a meeting with a, a, a woman a senior policy advisor for a minister that will remain unnamed. Um, and we had this whole conversation because they wanted to do a big public consultation about um, a, a very contentious topic. And the conversation was off by about two degrees. You know, something's off by two degrees. It doesn't feel too bad to start, but it becomes kilometres down the track. And um, so about 20 minutes in, I just thought, okay, I need to figure this out. So I started poking and prodding as I can you know, be mildly cantankerous, as you can probably see. And, um, and finally, and she got really irate, and she finally slammed her hand down on the table. She said, Pia, people should feel privileged. We are allowing them to have a say at all. And I said, thank you, and I laughed. And she was very disconcerted that this, you know, like little policy advisor for this person that she doesn't even know um, was laughing at her. But I laughed, and I said, look, thank you so much for saying that, because now I understand why this conversation has been so wrong. If you don't change that perspective, your consultation will fail. And you can't blame the technology, and you can't blame the people, and you can't blame the methodology. You only have that perspective um, to blame because people will smell that perspective a mile off and they will run for the hills. At best, they will run for the hills. At worst, you will get trolled beyond an inch of you know, your life. Um, and then I explained trolling to her, and she wasn't very happy about that. Um, but the, the, the point here, though, is that one of the big challenges that we have is a cultural change. Because the idea that the general public have something of value to contribute, even if it's just feedback or even it's just an experience or even it's, uh, you know, an idea, is, is a new idea for a lot of people um, in the public service. Uh, you know, there, there is sort of the idea of serving the public's best interests and there is the idea of you know, getting the experts in so we can have the best possible outcome. But the idea that, um, that there is something of value to be gained from a public consultation is, is for a lot of people um, not entirely there. So th there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, there's a lot of pressures from industry to do certain things, this whole, you know, cloud first, and every time you say anything that isn't cloud first, you know, suddenly you're an antiquated dinosaur, and it's really quite funny. Uh, I remember going into a, a three and a half hour cloud consultation once. I nearly committed Harakiri, seriously. Um, this company decided to talk to us about, um, you know, what everyone around the world is doing, and, and within about 10 minutes, we were able to point out that every case study they gave us of every government 
was running government-hosted cloud, actually, or government-owned um, organizations, like a government-owned um, telco-hosted cloud. And it's like, well, so you're telling us to do something which isn't actually what the evidence you're presenting to us says. <laughs> Um, and then he got very irate and started pointing out that, you know, data.gov.au is hosted in the cloud. I'm like, yeah, it's open data. That's, that's cool. There are many, many, many things you can do in the cloud, but you need to be, um, you need to be strategic about it because otherwise we're just going to go through, you know, another version, the, the 21st century version of the outsourcing, you know, crash of the 90s. And we don't want to do that again because that kind of sucked. Um, apps is obviously one of the big pressures that's facing everyone at the moment. Everyone wants an app. And yet, building a native app that works on an iPhone and only that particular version of iPhone, and then a month later it breaks because you know something break, a, a library is updated. Not necessarily the most sustainable way to actually deliver a reliable, inclusive service for information and service delivery. Um, the idea of responsive web services is far better, but you've got to get that balance. And, and pushing back sometimes, again on ministers or again on people up the stack, and saying, you know what, an app store or building an app, is that actually going to meet our policy goals? And you know, coming back to that question, what's our policy goal? How are we going to meet our policy goal? Is spending 30K on an app that we're going to have to spend 100K over the next few years trying to maintain and, and um, keep up to date the best way to go about this? Um, and um, particularly, when, anyway, I won't go down my app ramp. Digital city is another pressure that's coming up uh, from a policy perspective. A lot of people running around talking about the importance of having a digital city strategy with no one actually understanding what that means apart from Wi-Fi. Um, and, um, and the, of course, IT, your technologists within your organizations know all of this stuff. If someone comes to you with a shiny PowerPoint presentation, um, and it's usually PowerPoint, um, although, some, although there's some, they're getting more into Prezi these days, um, and they say, oh, what you need to do is you need to do X, Y, Z. Go to your geeks and say to them, what on earth does this mean? Seriously, does this make sense? And your geeks will be like, well, <laughs> you know, let's talk to you about what it can do or not. Um, it, I think it's, geeks are the most underappreciated resource that we all have access to. So, just to finish off the imperatives a bit, I guess <laughs> after a long period of being in stasis, um, we, we need to basically, as, as government, as public service, we need to rapidly adapt or die, in, in my opinion. A little bit like Sigourney Weaver and Alien. Uh, so if you need you know, a, a bit of a, um, a role model, I reckon um, Alien or Aliens is probably a, a reasonable thing to think about. We've been in stasis, we've got to a point where we've done as much as we can kind of do we need to adapt, we need to change um, to meet these imperatives, which are pretty serious imperatives. Um, otherwise, and we're not, we'll never die, there will always be a role for government, but we'll become less relevant. And government, realistically speaking, is pretty much the only institution which has the actual service to the citizen and service to the public as its core mandate. So if we basically create a position where citizens are having to go and get all their services from um, from companies and from you know other places, and we're not making that those things available, and we're not making the information and the data and the service um, APIs available, then we're effectively locking people into a way that um, uh, isn't necessarily in their best interest. So, in terms of disrupting the status quo, how can we fix all this? This is kind of where I get to the positive side of it because you know I've given you all the doomsday stuff. Um, we're kind of you know rock meets hard place in that situation. So, so what can we do about it? Um, obviously, one of my big things has been this whole Gov 2.0 thing. And yes, I know it's a stupid term. Who here hates the term Web 2.0? Yay. Um, Web 2.0 has really become a bit of a buzz term as well. And I love it when people are say, I, I've actually heard someone actually say this. Oh, you know, we're going to, uh, we've been thinking about Web 3.0, um, but we're not going to implement it until we finish implementing our Web 2.0 strategy. What are you talking about? It's actually, it's, 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 it's uh, interesting. And again, no one's talking to the geeks. So for me, Gov 2.0, and apologies for the term, but it has become a little bit buzzy, um, probably slightly due to me. Um, but it kind of comes down to three things. Open and transparent government. And what does that mean from a technical implementation perspective? Well, look at what data you've got. Um, is it able to be opened? Does it have privacy implications? Are you able to de-identify and still make certain aspects of it open? But the big thing is, rather than treating open data as a reactive, retrospective, FOI mentality kind of approach, um, trying to see it as a, well, how can we have proactive data publishing, uh, real-time data publishing? How can we actually put uh, information out there in a way that is engaged with our system so it's automatically pushing stuff online? If you're publishing, um, I'll give an example, tenders ob obviously need to be published and, and contract information needs to be published. And there's, um, in the ACT, that's uh, one person who spends four hours a month, you know, taking the stuff out of the database, cleaning it up, putting it into HTML stuff, putting it online. If we can automate that, that's four hours of productivity gains we can get. So proactive data publishing, particularly in the case of a lot of data which we have to publish anyway, 
creates a whole bunch of productivity gain and creates a whole bunch of opportunities that the information is now available in a machine readable format that other people can actually use more effectively. And not just other people, but other parts of government. The amount of times that you wanted to get access to some statistics or some data about a particular thing, and, um, and that department won't give it to you, um, and then, um, or you can't find the person to talk to, it's all very complicated, so it's just easy to just go and buy it again. There's a lot of replication and duplication of efforts and of um, uh, data creation in government that, that you know, is, is a waste of money, really. So open data, the amount of effort to actually release something to the general public is close to the amount of effort that it takes to actually um, release something to another department. So in terms of best value for money, in terms of bet, you know, best, um, uh, most efficient use of money, if we're going to release it to another department anyway, why wouldn't we release it publicly? Um, so there's a lot of opportunities there. And this idea, does anyone know what I mean by the term API? A few. So for everyone else, um, if you've got a, um, a, an API is a, is a programmatic interface to a service. So what does that mean? Um, if I've got a, a form that I want to fill in to change my address, well, you can go to the website and you can fill in the form. Um, if you make the API available, it means that someone else can get the code of how the form works. They don't have access to your data, they don't have access to the privacy information, they don't have access, you know, you put in place all the appropriate security mechanisms as well. But they can see how the form is going to work, so now they can make an app, or they could make a, a, another website, or they could um, integrate it with another service that, like another department could say, okay, well, if you want to change your address with us, why wouldn't we have it so that it sends through that as a, as a suggestion to that other department? Why wouldn't, uh, in the ACT, I have to say, um, a lot of people like to bag out Canberra, and I can kind of understand it, but it is a lovely place. Um, but the ACT government have the most citizen-centric um, service delivery in Australia, and it doesn't mean it's where it could be, but it's certainly far more ahead of anyone else. I can change my address in one place, and it goes to the entire ACT government. Uh, I can go into a, what I call a Canberra Connect store, and access all of the ACT governments from the one place. I can access all the ACT government services through the one website. It's actually very, very clever how they've done it, and um, anyone that wants to find out more about that, I can talk uh, after the talk about structurally how they've done it and um, from a policy perspective how they've done it, but it's very, very interesting. So open and transparent government is about um, this concept of making government itself an API, because if you can collect and aggregate um, the information and the services from across government in a thematic way, now I can say, okay, well, let's have a health um, website, a single health website, not 14 websites across four different departments that do all different aspects of health, but one website that actually aggregates all of it into the one place properly. Um, now you start to get these opportunities to get into the second principle, which is about citizen-centric design. So moving from a structural to a thematic approach and personalised delivery of information and services. Um, I may say, okay, I want to know about health services available from the government. Well, okay, show me the ones in my postcode, show me the ones from my age. You know what, maybe I will create an account because, you know, there's this new um, uh, medical record thing that's been created for me, you know, because uh, I went to the doctor last week anyway. So, um, oh, you're going to remind me when my baby is up for a, a vaccination. Oh, uh, now you're going to tell me about the information coming up about um, my uh, obligations from a retirement perspective or my opportunities from a retirement perspective. You actually get an opportunity to deliver a truly personalised service to citizens. Um, the third one is about public engagement, which I've spoken about a bit. Um, I think that Gov2O and, the, the, and there's a really strong Gov2O community in Australia and there are skills being developed in this area and there's a lot, a lot of very innovative, very interesting projects happening around Australia. So I would suggest actually having a look at that community. And if someone introduces themselves to you as a social media expert, um, punch them. Um, if you want to know how to do online engagement well, if you want to know how to do any of this stuff well, find people that have done it. All right, um, and find a number of them have done it. Ask them how they did it and talk to your geeks and ask them how they would do it. Now, some other opportunities. Innovation in the public service, I think, is a bit of a challenge, particularly when everyone is under the pump, um, everyone needs to defend spending any money. And of course, um, I was there the day that the IT reinvestment fund um, from, the, um, uh, uh, from the federal government was actually uh, withdrawn back into the general budget and it was very frustrating because the whole point of that uh, IT reinvestment fund was to actually um, provide funding for departments and agencies to do things in new and interesting ways. That put us back a few years, in my opinion, and it was highly frustrating. How can we get innovation in the public service um, under the circumstances we're working in? Well, one of it is about, you know, actually encouraging a little bit of playtime, a little bit of skunk works. We don't have money, but we do have people. If you can give your people even just half a day a week, you know, or even just a couple of hours a week, or maybe a week a, a month, to just play on something that they want to do. If you could, you could run internal hack fest. You can have like little internal competitions to see if you can come up with new and clever ways. Like there's a lot of stuff you can do just within your departments 
and within your companies to actually encourage a skunk works um, exciting you know um, uh, culture for geeks who do what geeks do best. Uh, you can engage with the community. You can get involved with things like GovHack. And one of my fellow GovHack people uh, is right there, Jeff Mason. Uh, but we have a team in Canberra who are, are putting together, you know, this big national uh, hack fest on government data, working across seven cities with four different uh, state governments and federal government. Anyone interested in that, come and chat to either me or Jeff after the talk. But um, you know, you can get engaged with the community with these kinds of things. And a hack fest isn't just about saying, well, how can you use the data, but also, or how can you, you know, what sort of stuff can you create? But it's also about saying, well, how can you do this better? And if we see something done better that we like, how can we integrate that into our business as usual? Why wouldn't we go and engage with those developers? Or why, would, why wouldn't we take that idea and see if we can implement it into ours as well? It's like a, and I mean, I really hate to put it this way, and it's a little bit crass, but it's a, it's a really, really um, you know, cheap way to do innovation in a way. Um, get involved with what's happening out there because people have their own motivation to want to do things better. So why wouldn't you tap into that and collaborate with those people? Um, skills development, I think um, one of the, the challenges is that um, government is not seen as the place where you know hardcore uh, technology innovators go. Uh, in fact, it's kind of seen as the opposite in a lot of cases. But if we can actually start to create a culture of technology excellence and awesomeness across the government, um, then we can attract and support a geek culture and an innovative culture that actually gets things done. The amount of people, I mean, innovation is also a word that has been completely, completely screwed around. Um, a lot of people hear the word now and they, they, they shudder and I understand entirely why. But real innovation is actually about letting cool people do cool things, actually giving them permission to play and to come up with new ways to do things. It's worked very well for Google. Google give their, their people 20% playtime and pretty much all of their most successful products um, have been have come out of that. Have come out of their people actually being a ch uh, given a chance to play. Um, okay, so other things we can do. Iterative policy is one of my little um, bandwagons. I'm starting to jump on the idea that the way that we create policy at the moment generally is relatively static. We build the policy and then we leave it in place for ten years or until it dies. Um, if we take an approach that says, in the first case, we're more collaborative in the way that we develop policy, as I was describing before, but then, and this is where it gets kind of tricky. Um, on an ongoing basis, okay, what can we measure out of this policy? How do we define success of this policy? What are we learning on an ongoing basis through the imp implementation of this policy? Let's put just, it doesn't need to be a huge amount of bureaucracy, but let's just make it so that the people implementing it are able to feed back suggestions to the people maintaining it, right, and actually keep it as a live document. And on an ongoing basis, feed those lessons learned back into the policy so that, so that policy can adapt to new circumstances and new opportunities and new uh, issues. A very, very basic practical example of this was in the Queensland government um, with their social media approach with the Facebook. Um, and what they found was that they had a team of people and every day the, the people would be briefed on, okay, here's what's happening, you know, um, here are the ways to deal with things and, um, and if there's anything outside of this scope, send it to me. So everyone was given a lot of freedom to actually just participate online, you know, within a, within a particular scope and with the responsibility of, you know, being representative of the Queensland police. And every day there would be fringe cases that went up to, you know, to the manager. And every day that manager would deal with those fringe cases and then document how to deal with those fringe cases and then feed that back into the team. So every day the team was being upskilled into how to, how to deal with more and more complex cases. This, this idea of, that's a very, very small version of what I'm talking about, but this idea of iterative policy means that we might have a chance where even the absolutely worst developed policy in the history of policies can turn into a good policy within a short period of time if you build into place the, um, the capacity for the policy to iteratively adapt um, according to the outcomes of what the policy is or isn't achieving. Hopefully that makes a small amount of sense, but I'll, I'll move on. Um, I guess that, um, and there's also a, a huge amount of development for skills within the public service, a huge amount of um, requirement for this. We have uh, online engagement I've, I've mentioned but data analysis and data and visualization policy, um, the development of things like APIs and automation skills are all really, really important in being able to, uh, to really take advantage of this space. Um, there is a huge culture and generation change coming in the federal public service at the moment. I think it's something like 50% of the senior executive service are retiring in the next five years. So that's, that's a fairly huge generation change that's coming in. And, um, and there's been a lot of changes from a policy perspective and a cultural perspective, even just in the last four years. There's a lot of pressure from the top now around online engagement, around big data, around you know, different ways to do policy. 
they, they just launched an APS policy visualization network, which already has three or 400 members of people across the federal public service who are looking at completely different ways of doing policy and doing um, data stuff, which is quite fascinating. Um, and of course, the, ta the Gov2 task force, even though that was four years ago, a lot of the out outcomes and recommendations of that have really started filtering into, you know, and filtering um, down into um, departments and agencies across the federal government, which has been very, very interesting. What's the role of open source in all of this? Um, I know I haven't got too much more time, but um, in the first case, there's a lot of technologies we can obviously tap, and there's and very good technologies. The, one of the benefits of using <laughs> an open source technology is that you're not locked into a particular vendor. And I've seen this time and time again, where someone says, oh, this is a great product, it serves exactly what we need, and then the moment you want to change something, you know, it, it costs a bomb. What happens if something happens to the company? What happens if the company doesn't actually fulfill their service obligations? Well, you've got nowhere to go because you've got that one product and only that one company supports it. At least with open source, you've got the opportunity to say, well, actually there is an open market for supporting this and um, so we can go to somebody else if, if um, our, our support company doesn't fulfill our obligations, uh, sorry, our requirements. Um, and yeah, th there's a lot of, re you'll hear a lot more about um, the, the benefits of the technology itself, but the ones I want to focus on is methodologies. So the methodologies of collaborative development that, that spans every traditional barrier to collaboration and, and communication and entry and stuff. There's a lot we can learn about the methodologies of doing open source development. Um, there are still, there are still people that do software development um, in the world, uh, anywhere, and it still amazes me that anyone would do this, who, you know, write a bit of code and then they put it into a zip file and they email it. You know, and then that's, and they don't even version control it in a lot of cases. There, there, there's so much we can learn from good uh, code development and good um, uh, vision management as well, um, which sort of brings me to the culture. The culture of sharing and um, uh, mutual benefit through enlightened self-interest is a really good culture. You know, if you can actually align people's motivations with your policy goal, you've got a better chance of your policy goals being sustainable and being um, successful. So tapping into the, the culture, I think, of open source is a very handy thing. And, um, and it, I think it's interesting to note that open source is really just part of the continuum. We sort of started with hacker culture from the 60s, you know, went to open source, there was the open knowledge, you know, explosion with Wikipedia, um, and, you know, now we've got this whole open government movement. Of course, next will be the open open movement. I look forward to, you know, everyone sort of joining in on the open open movement. But we've sort of, it, it's all part of a, a bigger picture, and if you actually look back at the history of and at the, um, and where, what's brought us up to these sort of open government, gov um, uh, scene, it's, it's, I think it's, it's interesting to see where that's going to go. Um, the idea of a highly connected and empowered and a motivated community that can effectively solve problems faster than ever before and more effectively than ever before is something that we need to tap into as government. So my, I guess my final thought for you is, um, and then we'll do some questions, but who here has heard of the term singularity? Yeah, it's, it's the same people who have done all the techie stuff. Um, for everyone else, there's this, there's this term being bandied around uh, called singularity. And for a lot of people, it, it, it's, it's like the mecca of geeks. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> Uh, it's used to describe pretty much anything from um, the machines taking over and humanity finally being wiped out, Terminator style, through to um, you know uh, cyborgs. It, it's used to describe a lot of things. What it actually means as a definition is a little bit more interesting. It means that the distance between things is reduced to nothing. So whether it's your device and you, and I mean right now my device is separate from me. Wearable computing takes it to the next level. Embedded computing takes it to the next level. Um, and I'll. I'll give you one last, uh, I'll give you just one other a body hacking example because it is so fascinating. I knew of a, a woman who embedded a tiny little sphere, metal sphere, into the tip of her finger, which had mercury and a free floating magnet inside, right? Yeah. So, what that means is that the free floating magnet spins according to the, the megahertz of the, um, of the re um, frequency around her, right? Here's what's fascinating that is a completely alien thing to have in your body, completely alien. The, the thing that it is detecting is completely alien, but her brain, because it's such a fascinating organ, um, is uh, actually adapted to new input. Let that, let, think about that. Our brains actually adapt to completely new and completely foreign input. She was able to accurately detect different frequencies um, after not having it in even all that long. Unfortunately, then the um, iron actually eroded out of the casing and it, it shattered and she had to you know, have emergency surgery. But apart from that, <laughs> um, the fact that our brains can actually adapt to new input is, is you know, that's not all that far away. They've already been able to start 3D printing, you know, kidneys and, and um, new organs and stuff. We're not going to have waiting lists for organs within the next 20, 30 years. It's a very, very interesting time we're going into. 
Singularity is about the reduction of, of space um, in between things, and whether it's your device and you, or whether it's um, two people, or whether it's two devices. It's about reducing um, the, the distance in between. So I guess what I put to you is that what we're hitting and what we're heading towards now is effectively a, a democracy singularity, <laughs> where the distance between citizens and the system is, has reduced quite significantly. And even though a lot of people within the public service think that they're on the inside pushing people outside of the, of the, of the walls of the castle and outside of the moat, the fact is that the people have already put the drawbridge down, have walked through, and they're sitting on your bunk bed looking at you saying, what now? Um, the <laughs> all of the traditional sort of defensive perspective of us versus them is, is not the case anymore. We are all part of the one society, and, um, and government will do best by engaging with that and actually um, uh, working towards a more collaborative approach to uh, serving the best interests of citizens in the 21st century. So on that rather bizarre note, um, I will actually finish up. And uh, I just want to uh, finish up by saying that uh, in my new role working for the Australian Government Chief Technology Officer and uh, working on Gov 2.0, and once I've had a little bit more time to actually catch up with the ridiculously low amount of sleep I've had for the past seven weeks organising Sir Tim Berners-Lee, then uh, I look forward to having more cogent and, and um, sensible conversations with all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you. So question. We have time for a few questions, but we don't have a roving microphone. So, so yell. <laughs> so if you can yell and then appear for the there. recording to me with people's questions. So sure. Uh, okay, so the question is about how people have managed online, um, managed policies online. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's actually a lot of case studies of this around around the world. Um, one of the uh, I'll actually give you an example from my experience, and then I'll give you another example. So from my experience, um, I was involved in a bunch of consultations where we said, which were just straight consultations, not collaborative policy development itself but where we had a policy that needed to be consulted on and we did it uh, using both online and offline mechanisms. So we developed, um, in my previous job, a thing called, that we called the public sphere methodology. And interestingly and retrospectively, I was able to realise that it was actually a mapping of pretty much how um, uh, successful open source projects work regardless. So that w and, and successful online communities work, because I've been on various online communities for about 15 years, so it was good to sort of tap into that experience. But it basically starts like this. You say, okay, well, What's the problem you're trying to solve? Because you want to give pe people something meaningful. You don't just want to say, hey, what do you reckon? Because that's meaningless and, and mildly disrespectful in a lot of ways. You say, okay, what's a very specific problem? You then research that community. Where do they meet? Like, who are the community leaders? Who are the organizations, the stakeholders, all those kinds of things? But beyond that, where are the one-to-many mechanisms for that community? Is it a newsletter? Is it a Twitter hashtag? Is it a conference that they all go to once a year? Is it a particular mailing list? Is it where, where are the one-to-many mechanisms that you can actually engage with people uh, in that community? Then what you do is um, having sort of, at that, by that point, having a bit of a skeleton plan of how you're going to go about this policy consultation, you actually engage some of those thought leaders, even ones that maybe disagree with you. And you say, look, we're about to launch, you know, we'd like to launch this consultation. We want to get the community's input. Um, we'd love for you to look over this and tell us what you think about, about the language, about what we're trying to achieve, about uh, any further background you can give us, all that kind of stuff. And what happens is that they help you tweak your language, because if your language is wrong when you first launch, it will um, it'll turn people off. And because people are so saturated by information, if you don't make the right impression in the very first instance, then they won't engage with your consultation. And the more barriers to entry, which includes language to your, con to your consultation, then um, the, the more extreme a perspective you'll get, because you'll turn off all the, the people, the moderates, so to speak. It'll only be the people who are super wanting to get involved. Um, it, I won't go through the whole methodology, but um, basically it, it went right through to having a um, final, um, beautifully crowdsourced and analysed and forensically um, contextualised um, piece of policy feedback that then goes back to the people developing the policy. The next stage is to actually develop it uh, collaboratively, which is one of the stages I'm, uh, I'm actually looking at doing a collaborative policy development uh, just in the next uh, probably three months or so. So that'll be worth keeping an eye on. But, um, but there's been legislation of different countries that has actually been crowdsourced. They've put it into systems such as, amusingly, GitHub, um, where they um, say to people, okay, here's our current draft of legislation, or here's what we're trying to achieve, put up your draft. And then they actually work with people to create the right language and such. So there's, there's a lot of case studies. I can put a bunch on my blog if you like.
So the question is about how the industry can actually help advance um, the, you know, these sort of goals around governments, API and such, and, and get those sort of contracts. So it, it actually touches upon a point which I actually forgot to go into, it was in my notes, um, about procurement. Um, it, it, it's an interesting, in Australia there's actually a policy at the moment that some of you may not know, which basically says that every government department, federal government department, in every tender request that they put out there has to include in the tender request how have you um, considered open source. Now what happens is um, there is actually a person who sits not too far from me who watches every Oz tender as it comes out and any tender that doesn't have that clause, he calls them up and says, why haven't you met your procurement guideline obligation? So he's now got 100% uh, compliance, which is, which is a lot of work actually, but he, he's done pretty well. Um, but the thing is that you can have, all, you can have the, we, we can set in place the conditions where we're um, trying to encourage you know, uh, a particular, not a particular solution, but we're trying to encourage diversity in the solutions that come out so that we can actually have a, um, a, a reasonable spread of things that we can assess. But if no one puts the solution in, then we've only got the other solutions to choose from. Uh, so part of it is actually just going for tenders and actually being part of the game. There's a guy called Don Easter, who's the IT supplier advocate for the Australian federal government. He works in the Department of Innovation. And his entire job is to look at um, procurement processes for the IT industry um, with government and try to streamline them and try to make them easier. Things have become a lot easier, like the, um, the DCAS, the Data Center as a Service um, panel for federal government, is something that's a reasonably low barrier for companies to join. And um, basically companies, want, uh, sorry, uh, departments and agencies wanting to procure anything up to the value of 80K can go through that very, very simply. It's, a, it's trying to simplify the capacity to actually procure things. And I know it's only 80K, but it's, you know, um, for a lot of projects that's actually quite handy. Um, so part of it is just being in the game, part of it is understanding what government's trying to achieve, and part of it is actually presenting, you know, those innovative approaches and going and presenting to government and saying, if you do it in the way that your tender request is stipulating, then you are locking yourselves into another 10 years where you're not going to be able to move. Because they don't necessarily know that. And you've also got to remember the people that are running the procurement are the procurement policy people who are not the strategic people. So actually getting in and talking to the strategic people in departments and, um, and saying, well, w what are you trying to achieve and how can we uh, help you with the information you need to make sure that your procurement processes are actually mapping your policy goals, so to speak. Uh, and again, that's getting that, that bridge between business and IT closed, because at the moment, you know, the business comes up with the idea, um, they either make their IT do it or they go out to tender, but there's not the, the connection around what will these procurement processes lead to in the long term. The UK government put in place a really interesting thing where they said that as part of a tender response you had to say what your exit cost for your solution was. That's a fascinating one. Because when you start looking at things like SharePoint, um, the exit cost is actually quite high because it has a dependency upon a number of things. So if you are on SharePoint and you want to move to something else, it, it's actually quite a difficult thing to extract. So. Um, yeah, it, it, it was interesting. I think there's a lot of uh, work that can, be th that can be done in procurement policy, and um, that's now the uh, domain of the department I work for, so it's going to be interesting to look into that myself. Thank you, Sia. Cool. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but I took an enormous amount away, and um, obviously the key message is go to your geeks, and if you're a geek, Good luck. <laughs> um, and congratulations to Pia on her new role. So let's thank her once again.